Welcome to this course of Raider and SAR principles. This tutorial has been developed free of charge for educational purposes only and without any commercial interest. The images and figures of this tutorial have been reproduced from open sources and are seated accordingly, unless they were created by the author. If they may be infringing any copyright, please let us know to remove it in the next release. This is the outline of the presentation. We are going to start with the Raider principle. Then we will move to SAR principles. SAR is the acronym of Synthetic Aperture Raider. Some SAR processing. And finally, a brief summary of the different SAR sensors available in the world. Raider principles. Well, a Raider basically consists in a system that is able to transmit and receive electromagnetic pulses. For instance, in this case, an electromagnetic pulse is transmitted by the, radio, er, by the radar, it travels at the speed of the light towards the target, and it is reflected back to the radar by the different features of the target. In that case, the target is a plane, and we can see in different colors, red, green, and blue, the different contributions of the different parts of the target on the received signal. Then, the amplitude of the returned signal depends on what is known the tra target reflectivity. At the same time, each received echo is delayed as it travels at the speed of the light. And finally, there can be a Doppler shift induced by either the radar or target velocity. Then this means that we have three elements that we can measure to characterize our target. The amplitude, the delay, that can be directly related with the range distance. This is the distance from the radar to the target. And finally, the Doppler frequency. The radar cross-sections, or also known as RCS, of a target of an object is the cross-sectional area of a perfectly reflecting sphere that will produce the same strength reflection as will the object in question. Then it is clear that RCS is an abstraction, as large objects in size can present low RCS, and obviously the contrary. RCS, anyway, depends on the size, the material, geometry, and orientation of the object and the radar operating frequency. The RCS of a radar target is SUS, an effective area that intercepts the transmitted radar power and then scatters that power isotropically back to the radar receiver. In that case, the power received of the, by the radar will depend on the transmitted power, the gain of the transmitting antenna, the distance from the radar to the target, the radar cross-section of the target that radiates isotropically the intercepted power that is once again attenuated by the losses introduced by the propagation of the signals, and finally it will depend on the effective area of the receiving antenna. If we want to use a radar to make a kind of image, it is important to know what is known as the range resolution. The range resolution is defined as the minimum spacing between two objects that can be individually detected. In that case, it is clear that the narrower or the shorter is the pulse, the better will be the resolution. In general, pulse duration is inversely related with the pulse bandwidth. This is, if we want a short pulse, we will have to transmit a large bandwidth. Then, in terms of range resolutions, signals with large bandwidth are desired, but in terms of power efficiency, we would like to have signals with large duration, because they will imply lower peak powers. Then the question is, could it be possible to have a signal that fulfills both conditions? The answer is yes. A posset chirp, or also known as a linear frequency modulated radar signal, is able to fulfill both conditions. Its main characteristic is that their instantaneous frequency is a linear function of time. 
The linear FM signal is known as a chirp in analogy with a bird's call. For instance, bats, dolphins, killer whales and other animals use chirps as a part of their sonars. For instance, in this example, we have, we can see the, the chirp that is transmitted, that was transmitted by the ERS satellite from the European Spatial Agency. In that case, the original chirp that corresponds with the pulse duration of 37.1 microseconds will provide a resolution of around 5.5 kilometers. By using the compression techniques that will be presented later, we can improve the resolution up to less than 10 meters. I repeat, the main characteristic of a chirp is that their instantaneous frequency is a linear function of time. K is what is known as the linear FM rate or chirp rate. It will rep represent the instantaneous frequency as a function of the pulse duration we will see that we have this linear behavior. The main characteristic of the chirp chirp signal is that it is able to achieve a uniformly filled bandwidth. Okay, if we look at the spectrum of the chirp, it will present this aspect, just an uniform spectrum. This will be the amplitude. If we look at the say phase, we'll see that we have a phase that is, that presents a quadratic dependency with frequency. I have commented that it is possible to compress this chirp and after the compression, what we have is a chirp of much better resolution than before. Then the two way resolution can be related with one divided by two times the bandwidth of the chirp and that case multiplied by the speed of the light. This case will be the resolution expressed in distance. For some mathematical developments, it can be interesting to characterize the spectrum of the chirp mathematically. In that case, we are not going to enter into details of all the developments, we just only say that uh, we can use what is known as the principle of stationary phase to obtain a mathematical approximation of the chirp spectrum. Basically, the aspect of this chirp spectrum will have one term that is the scaled version of the chirp envelope. If the original chirp uh, was uh, a rectangular pulse, then the uh, chirp spectrum will present also the shape of a rectangular pulse plus one phase term that is quadratic with respect to the frequency. In that case, the matched filter that is used to compress the, the chirp signal will have exactly this expression that is a conjugated version of the original chirp spectrum. What we do with this matched filter is to cancel out this quadratic phase term. Then let's move to the data acquisition and sampling. Obviously, the signal processing is based on the digital storage and man manipulation of the echo signal. Then what we receive from uh, our radar has to be translated to the analog, from the analog to the discrete domain in form of a finite length array. Then, the choice of the finite number of sample is dictated first by the support of the target area. This is the extension of the area in we have scattered or targets or different elements that we're going to characterize. And secondly, the bandwidth of the radar signal and its temporal length. This is the length of the transmitted pulse. The temporal acquisition window that we have to implement to correctly store the received signals depends on the spatial support band. In that case, we can assume that all the targets of interest are concentrated within this extension. Then, the code signals from the closest target will arrive after this delay that depends on the two times the distance from the radar to the first 
target divided by the speed of the light. Similarly, the echo from the farthest target will last until 2 times the distance divided by the speed of the light plus the duration of the transmitted pulse. Okay? Those two values will define the temporal window that we have to use to sample correctly our data. And this will be the temporal length of this window. The transmitter radar signal has energy within a finite band in the frequency domain. And the extent of this band will depend on the bandwidth of the used signals. As the echoed signal is just a linear combination of shifted version of the transmitter radar signal, the support of its Fourier transform is always within the same finite radar band. Then it is well known that to sample the signal without aliasing, we have to fulfill what is known the Nyquist sampling criterion. This is the sampling frequency has to be at least two times the maximum frequency. But the baseband maximum frequency depends on the signal type we are working with, and we have two options, what is now real or video band or complex or baseband with IQ. In the physical world, all signals are real, but within the digital one, sometimes it is more efficient to work with complex signals. Then the hardware complexity as well as limitations can impose one option or the other. Let's look at the two options. The first one, the real or video band. This is sampling a real signal. In that case, we, we do, do not completely bind the signal. We have a um, symmetric spectrum, which means the signal is real. And in that case, we can sample the data using only one channel. The other option is to completely baseband the signal. In that case, the spectrum is not symmetrical, which means the signal is complex. And in that case, as we can see, the maximum frequency is lower than before, which means the sampling frequency can be half the previous one, but the problem is that, or the limitations that now we have to uh, use two channels. One for the real part and one for the imaginary part. Okay? Then it is not clear which one is the best option. For the first one, we need a higher sampling rate. For the second one, we have to use two channels. Anyway, independently on the option uh, use, at the end, all signals are converted to complex one before uh, computing or using the, the computers. Okay, then all developments will be done assuming complex signals. Then a basic reconstruction algorithm for this kind of unidimensional radar will be baseband the received signal, digitize the baseband the adequate signal, compute the discrete Fourier transform of the signals, compute the digital reference baseband echo signal for the matched filter in either the time or frequency domain, filter the echo signal, and finally display the results with the appropriate range bins. This is translating the delay to range distance. Sub principles. We are going to start with the, what is known as the side-looking real aperture radar. Imagine that there is a radar on board a plane or a satellite or any kind of moving platform that we want to use to make an image of the Earth. The footprint on the Earth depends on the radiation pattern of the antenna used. The radiation pattern can be characterized by two angle, angles, the antenna beam width along azimuth, and the antenna beam width along range or in elevation. Okay? If we have a very directive antenna, this footprint on Earth will be smaller. If the antenna is less directive, this footprint will be wider. There is also, for large antennas, a, an approximation that allows us to derive the beam width as a function of the 
uh, physical dimension of the antenna. This is larger antennas will be will be more directive. Okay, by using some basic trigonometry as well as the incident angle, it is quite easy to obtain the footprint dimensions depending on the characteristics of the antenna and the height of the moving platform. Well, if we want to make an image, it is interesting to know which will be the resolution we can achieve. Okay, in range, two targets at a given azimuth position can be resolved in range if their echoes are separated by this expression. Okay, this is exactly the same we have we saw before for the uh, radar equation. Okay, the larger the bandwidth the of the transmitted signals, the better will be the range resolution. Just using regional bandwidth, practical SLAN range resolution are easy to achieve. For instance, by transmitting 15 megahertz, we can achieve resolution of 10 meters. Transmitting 100 megahertz, we can achieve 1.5 meters of resolution. That is quite good. On the azimuth uh, direction, similarly, the resolution will be the minimum distance between two points separated in azimuth that can we can resolve. Obviously, uh, this depends on the antenna's footprint along the azimuth direction. Okay, playing mathematically with the previous expressions, we can see that it inversely depends on the extension of the antenna on the azimuth direction. Let's put some figures. For instance, using the MBSAT uh, data, working uh, 5.331 gigahertz, this is the wavelength will be 5.63 centimeters. Assuming that, for instance, we have an uh, antenna with a length of 10 meters, incidence angle 21 degrees, and the uh, height of the satellite 850 kilometers, we will see that we are going to have a resolution of 4.4 kilometers. Okay? An image of such poor resolution will be of no practical use. Similar, if we want to obtain a resolution, an image with an azimuth resolution of 10 meters, we should use an antenna with a length of more than 4 kilometers. That obviously it is impossible technologically to deploy on orbit an antenna of such dimension. Luckily, we have the, what is known the synthetic aperture radar concept. Okay? To improve the azimuth resolution, we should have a larger antenna. This is clear. But it is technologically impossible. We can use the concept of synthetic aperture, and this is exactly the same that is used in antennas. Okay? An array of antennas uses a set of low directive antennas with the proper weighting that properly combined, can achieve higher directivity. One example is the very large array that is in New Mexico that is used for uh, astronomical radio observations. Then, the principal idea behind SAR is to synthesize the effect of a large aperture physical radar, whose construction will be invisible. Then, assuming that we have our radar on board a moving uh, platform, due the, to the satellite trajectory, the pulses illuminate a swath parallel to the satellite track. The footprint of a single pulse is the dark shaded area. Then, it is obvious that each target in the scene is illuminated by several pulses. For instance, in that case, red that target will be illuminated by one, two, and three pulses. Which forms the synthetic aperture. For instance, the uh, green target that is farther away from the, from the radar will be illuminated by a larger number of pulses. Or, in the same, in similar words, we are going to have a larger synthetic aperture. The big advantage of this philosophy is that now the azimuth resolution is constant and roughly is half of the antenna size along the azimuth direction. 
the range resolution is exactly the same that the one we are going to have with a radar. There are different SAR acquisition modes. The typical one is the strip map. In that case, the antenna is pointing, the antenna pointing direction is held constant as the radar moves and we explore this kind of strips over the earth. In the case of the scansar, the antenna is scanned in range several times during the synthetic aperture. In that case, we are able to achieve larger swaths, but degrading the azimuth resolution. We also have the spotlight mode. In that case, the azimuth resolution of the strip map case is improved by increasing the angular extent of the illumination. We do that by steering the beam gradually to focus on an area and synthesize a larger aperture or in similar words as we we had a smaller antenna in that case the coverage is not continuous recently a new mode has been implemented for instance on uh, the sentinel satellite and or as well as on uh, terrasar that is the topsar the terrain observation with progressive scans, SAR technique, is a form of scan-SAR imaging. In that case, in addition to the steering the beam in range, the beam is also electronically steered from backward to forward in an inverse way as the spot mode in the azimuth direction for each burst. In that case, the big advantage is that we avoid what is known the scalloping that was a characteristic of the scan-SAR mode. The scalloping is, uh, can be seen here, this kind of variation on the reflectivity of the image. The big advantage of the TOPSAR mode is that the image quality is better than with its previous version, the SCANSAR. If you look at the SAR image, we will see that there are some uh, distortions. Okay, We are used to look at the world with optical images. In practice, our eyes are an optical sensor. This will be, for instance, a Landsat optical image over the area of, of Barcelona and its equivalent SAR image. We can see that they look quite similar in some, some aspects, but there are many differences. For instance, we are here sensitive to the reflectivity of the terrain, which means that things brighter on the optical sight can be uh, black or less uh, of almost invisible on the electromagnetic side and just the contrary. Another uh, feature that can be seen is that the different mountains seems tilted towards uh, the radar. Now we are going to explain why. The ascent is projected to the what is known the slant range geometry. Then the send features are ordered in the image in increasing ranges. This is in increasing distance to the radar. We have different phenomena. The first one is the foreshortening. The slopes facing towards the radar are imaged with very similar ranges, depending on the relative incidence angle. These sloping features appear compressed and bright due to the strong backscattering coefficient. Then the slopes facing away will be conversely be expanded and darker. The layover is an extreme case of foreshortening that occurs when the slope of the terrain is greater than the angle of incidence. Then the top of the object is imaged before the bottom and the feature appears inverted in the image. And finally, the shadowing, this is something similar to the case of optical images, occurs when the radar beam is blocked from reaching parts of the terrain. These areas appear in the image as dark or void areas. Well, the radar scattering coefficient is the radio of the average reflected electromagnetic wave power to the incident electromagnetic power. It is a normalized dimensionless number and it is usually expressed in dBs. In dBs. The Sigma naught is defined with respect to the nominally or horizontal plane 
and in general has a significant variation with incidence angle, wavelength and polarization as well as with properties of the scattering surface itself uh, shape, roughness, dielectric and magnetic properties, water contents and so on it describes the average scattering properties of the scene there are two kinds of targets what are known as deterministics that has the property that there is a single or dominant scatter within the resolution cell will be the case of, for instance, using this corner reflector that is used for calibration purposes that produce a very bright signal and there will be just one scatter within the resolution cell on the contrary, the distributed targets presents multiple scatters within the resolution cell that will be, for instance, this case these bindars the distributed scatter has an important property that justifies why SAR images look quite grainy. This is due to what is known as the speckle noise. The speckle is a multiplicative noise because the relative phase of individual scatters within a resolution cell are strongly dependent upon the radar viewing angle. Then the contribution of the different scatters are coherently added and this means that for the same terrain characteristics for some pixels we can have a constructive uh, addition or in phase addition of all the different contributors and in others uh, a lower levels of amplitude this is what it causes this grainy aspect okay it is also multiplicative noise because the higher the reflectivity the higher is the noise the only way to reduce this this uh, noise is by using what is known as multi-looking which is basically an averaging of pixels anyway there are advanced filters that can reduce a speckle, speckle but at the same time trying to uh, minimize the loss of resolution then let's move to the SAR uh, processing looking first to the two-dimensional SAR signals we have seen that pulses are transmitted with a given pulse repetition frequency PRF while the platform is moving then the send reflects the pulse for a given azimuth position that is sampled with the proper sampling frequency then the SAR data is clear bidimensional and it belongs to two different domains one is the what is known as the fast time or range domain in this domain the transmitted pulses travel at the speed of the light the slow time or azimuth domain in that case the signal travel at the speed of the moving platform for the sake of simplicity we can consider that the platform in practice is at a fixed position where the pulse is transmitted and received this is the speed of the platform is much smaller than the speed of the light then the received pulse at a given azimuth position will depend on the position in which the pole, original pulse is transmitted and the position of the target and what we have is just a delayed version of the envelope depending on the radar to target distance and a phase term that also depends on this distance if the radar antenna goes pointing perpendicularly to the moving platform the range as a function of decimal time can be expressed by using this mathematical expression okay doing uh, a first order approximation and assuming that the distance is much larger than the the extent of the synthetic aperture and this point define it as the closest, uh, closest point of approach this is when the radar is closer to the target we can calculate the Doppler associated to each azimuth position because we have a relative motion of the radar with respect to the static target in that case this Doppler can be obtained by using the derivative of the range depending on the azimuth time and we can obtain this expression and what we have 
in the azimuth direction is a signal very similar to a chirp. In that case, we also have a linear frequency modulated chirp. This term k is the azimuth FM rate, or also known as Doppler rate. This Doppler rate reflects how the instantaneous Doppler dep uh, vary, um, changes depending on the azimuth observation time. Here we have the range variation with respect the closest point of approach, and here we have the Doppler variation with respect to the azimuth time. In case that the antenna is pointing with a certain screen to the moving platform, the Doppler at each azimuth position can be expressed in a very similar way, but now we have an extra term that is what is known as the Doppler centroid. And this Doppler centroid is the Doppler when the target is illuminated by the maximum of the antenna radiation pattern. Similar we have, this will be the range variation with respect to the closest point of approach, and this will be the variation of the Doppler. As we have to sample signals on the azimuth domain, we have to select the proper pulse repetition frequency to perfectly characterize or to perfectly uh, store the, the signal in the azimuth domain. Uh, then the Nyquist sampling rate says that the minimum PRF will be set by the azimuth bandwidth. Okay, the overall azimuth bandwidth will depend on the Doppler rate and the overall observation. The smaller the antenna in azimuth, the larger the observation time, and the larger the overall Doppler spectrum. If the PRF is too low, then there will, be, there will appear ambiguities and aliasing, as in any kind of uh, signal. But also, it depends on the location as well as on the extent of the scene. Then, the range swath width, in that case, the rider cannot receive while transmitting. The slant range interval that can be accommodated between two successive transmit pulses will depend on the pole repetition interval. This is the inverse of the pole repetition frequency minus the pulse length. And this criterion concerns the length of the receive window. Okay, in other words, the receive wi window has to be located between two successive transmitted pulses. The receive window timing, in that case, the energy coming from ground must arrive between pulse times. This criterion concerns to the start of the receiving window. In satellites, the echo of a pulse is received after several ones have been transmitted. In that case, we transmit pulse A, but the reflection from the Earth arrives after two new pulses have been transmitted. Then, this will be the two-dimensional SAR signal. Let's forget a little bit about all the mathematics and let's concentrate on the different terms. What we have is a complex constant, an envelope that is associated to the envelope of the transmitted pulse, usually, traditionally, is a rectangular function, and the range chirp that is delayed for each azimuth position. Then in azimuth, what we have is a new, another envelope. In that case, this envelope is the antenna radiation pattern of in the azimuth direction, a chirp associated to the azimuth direction, and finally a phase term that is associated to the round trip delay at the closest point of approach. The raw data will show its contribution spread in both range and azimuth dimensions. Then the SAR signal is just a bidimensional matrix. The SAR processor has to focus the signal in both dimensions to retrieve the original single target. Then the idea can be extended to a complex scene as we assume that each target can be treated independently of the rest. This is what is known as the Born approximation because we assume in SAR that there are no interaction among targets. SAR data can be range compressed with a matched filter. In azimuth it is more difficult due to this no what is known as the range cell migration. We have seen that for a single target the instantaneous range 
changes as an hyperbolic function with the azimuth time. Depending on the range sampling, the response of a target can migrate through different range cells. And this has to be taken into account and compensated. So, uh, through a data interpolation, we can compensate this range cell migration. As the algorithm usually focuses the targets on its zero Doppler position, this is the closest point of approach, the zero Doppler range is used as a reference. It is usually done on the Doppler domain for computational uh, efficiency. One of the oldest algorithms, there are um, several one, is the range Doppler algorithm that was developed in 1976 for processing CSAR SAR data. Uh, the algorithm is designed to achieve processing efficiency using frequency domain operations in both range and azimuth while maintaining the simplicity of one-dimensional operation. It takes advantage of the approximate separability of processing in these two dimensions, okay, allowed by the large difference in the time scales of the range and azimuth data. Basically, it consists of compressing the range data and the azimuth data on the, the, the data in the range and azimuth directions independently. Uh, the algorithm uses the Fresnel approximation, but we are not going to enter into details. Summarizing, the result is a separable two-dimensional processing of the fast time as and slow time SAR signals, which respectively yield the target function distribution in the range and azimuth domains. This could be a basic range Doppler algorithm. We'll start with the raw data, a range fast Fourier transform. We have now the, the data on the range frequency domain. We do the range compression of the data by using a matched filter on the frequency domain. Once the data has been compressed and inverse fast Fourier transform, we have the data compressed in range and we we'll uh, repeat the process in the azimuth. An azimuth fast Fourier transform, the range cell migration compensation, we compress the signal in, in azimuth, and finally, through an inverse fast Fourier transform, we obtain the final single look complex image. If everything has been done correctly, and starting from the raw data, we can obtain the single loop complex. In that case, this is an uh, image of the city of Barcelona using ERS uh, data. We can see here a detail of the of the image. For the ERS data, the resolution was very different in in range and in azimuth, and uh, this makes that the aspect ratio of of the image was not very really nice. We have a ground resolution of around 20 meters in range and for in azimuth. After some multi looking to accommodate um, proper aspect ratio and reduce the speckle, we can see here the final image. We can see different features, the city of Barcelona, the airport, the mountains, and so on. In that case, this will be the azimuth direction, and we can see the distortions on the image as the different uh, slopes of the mountains appear compressed towards the radar. With brand new uh, satellite, we can obtain extremely high resolution data. In that case, this is an example of Terrasar high resolution spotlight data. In that case, we have combined three different images uh, taken in three different days, 12 uh, January 2008, 21st December 2007 and 3rd of January 2008, in that case red, green and blue. We can see in white all the features of the scent that has no change in, among the different acquisition dates and what is interesting is to look what happens at the sea that obviously here we have uh, changes. For instance, here we can see clearly a ferry that goes only uh, on the 21st of uh, December. The sea waters as it changes appears with different colors. It's also interesting uh, this area here where 
that correspond to to this one, in which we have we have this kind of uh, buoyant uh, small vessels that they drift from day to day, and this is the reason that it seems that sometimes we have the same uh, vessel but repeated in different colors. We can also see this strange feature of the Sydney uh, bridge that doesn't seem to appear on the optical picture, but Getting into the details, we'll see that is just a structure that was placed just to celebrate the New Year's Eve. Finally, just a summary of the different SAR sensors. The first SAR was launched in 1978, was the CSAR, launched by NASA JPL. There are, here, uh, we have not put all the different sensors, just a brief selection of them. We also have the ERS uh, C-band radar from the European Special Agency, the Japanese uh, L-band GRS uh, satellite, the CIRC-X uh, missions that was uh, jointly carried out by NASA and DLR, Radarsar one from the Canadian Space Agency, the famous Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, SRTM, that allowed by using interferometric techniques to generate a complete DM model of the whole Earth, the Envisat satellite, Alos Pulsar, the new uh, satellites are Radarsat 2, Alos 2, Sentinel, Terrasar X, Cosmos Kaimet, Tandem X, and hopefully to be launched the Spanish uh, path satellite that is quite similar to Terrasar X. In order to make uh, a SAR, the only thing that we need is a radar and a moving platform. This means that we can also use uh, SAR or can, we can also develop SARS by using airborne or ground based platform. In that case, for the airborne case, we have the ESR and the FSAR from DLR, AirSAR from NASA JPL, Air and Pamir from Afghan, Ramses from Onera, the SAR 580 from CCRS. We can also have ground-based SAR, in that case, GDSAR developed at UPC, that we have uh, the SAR, the radar mounted over a rail that can be moved. And also, for instance, Sabrina, in that case, we, it's uh, by a static configuration. In that case, we have the receiver on ground and we are using uh, commercial satellites as a source of opportunity. Well, this is the end of the talk. Uh, many thanks for your attention.